Good afternoon. Today is the 14th of August and it's time to answer some of your viewer questions. Uh, I left the window open because it's a little bit muggy today. I do apologise if there's a bit of background noise. I've had a lot of questions this time. Some of them are um, amusing, some of them are very strange, some of them are somewhere in between. If I pronounce your name wrong, I apologise. If I get any facts wrong, I apologise. That's just the way, unfortunately, that it goes on this channel. I'm going to start with questions from the community page of the channel. And uh, the first one is from Aaron D'Souza. My question is, what is the most unreliable car you ever owned? Well, there's two answers to that. The most unreliable classic car I've ever owned is probably my Triumph Dolomite. That had an awful lot of problems with it. Um, my gosh, the uh, screen heater didn't work. A lot of the lights didn't work when I got it. Um, a lot of the tyres were not very good on it. The car didn't run properly. The, I think the hose for the servo-assisted brakes was perished. I needed refitting or something. Um, just on and on and on and on, trouble, 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 British Leyland, etc. Um, I didn't keep the car very long. I was uh, very young at the time and still living with my mother in her house and she wasn't very fond of it, having had a Toledo back in the 70s, so that had to go. The other one, it's sort of a daily car that's been the most unreliable. Yes, my uh, 2004 Rover 45 1.4 Club SE was terrible. That had so many problems. Um, head gasket failed. Uh, wow, that was just the start of it. Security control unit failed. New key fobs. Um, the steering ignition barrel sort of fell apart. Just endless, endless, endless issues with that car. I bought it for 2400 and sold it for 300 after three years or something and oh, absolutely, absolutely awful. Um, didn't put me off Road 45 for life amazingly. I've still got one and I'm sitting in it right now. So there's your question. Those are the two most unreliable cars I've ever owned. Next question is from Peter Headley. Would you recommend an R8 Rover that uh, is defined as the 200 and 400 series Rovers from 89 to 95 as well as the um, Cabriolet, Coupe and Tora made up to 99 as a first time classic? Any specific tip as to what to look for? K series or D series Honda engine or indeed of course the uh, Rover T series engine which they also had pre or post revision. I have had um, an early R8, you would have seen that on the channel, a 1991 uh, 216 SLI automatic. And I've also had a very late R8. The five door R8 finished production in 1995, and the one I had was a 96, and it was actually an October 96 registered car. So, um, yeah, I have some experience with those. I've also driven. Other R8s, such as the one um, that Mr. Richardson for Furious Driving owns, the Tomcat. That's a very interesting car. I personally prefer the post facelift cars, which I define as after about 1992. There were various stages with the facelift because before 1994, the 200s didn't have the kind of chrome grille on them. They um, just had a sort of uh, reshaped um, front indicator lenses, so they uh, looked a little. Bit, they weren't square in profile; they were sort of rounded. And uh, the the saloons were four hundreds. After the face, I've had that chrome grill, and the chrome got stuck on all kinds of things. I've seen the chrome grill on really early cars, like sort of eighty nine, ninety as well. I personally just prefer the extra level of equipment that you you got in the later cars. Um, driver's airbags, things like that. The 91 216 that I had 
and the 96 216s I had, they were identical in terms of the engine. They were both 1.6 Honda automatics with 110 horsepower with a single overhead cam engine. And the uh, later car had just loads more things like rear headrest and electric sunroof. Um, it had remote control central locking when fitted. Um, didn't have it by the time I had it, but just all kinds of little revisions just to make that you know life a little bit easier. Um, some people prefer to put the pre facelift cars, and the one I had, the 91 car, didn't even have a catalytic converter on it, that's how old it was. So um, obviously, that meant less to go wrong. Um, I just prefer the look of the later cars, particularly the really late ones like the one I had. Um, that's just my preference. In terms of the K series and the D series, well. I've actually got a lot of <laughs> engines to choose from here. We've got the basic 95 horsepower 1.4k series. Then, with the facelift in about 92, 93, uh, there was the 103 horsepower 1.4k series. And then we've got the uh, later versions of the K series, the 1.6k series, that replaced the Honda D series engine in 1995 in the Coupe Cabriolet Tora. We've got the 1.8 VVC K series engine that went into the Rover Tomcat um, after about 1995, the uh, 143 horsepower version of that. So, you know, there were an awful lot of um, versions of that engine, and they all suffer from the same thing. The early cars actually, bizarrely, have a, a more um, tendency for reliability than the later ones. They have um, fewer problems for some reason, I don't know why. The later K-Series engines have plastic dowel pins in them which hold the engine together. And it's a very bad idea because it means those warp over time. And that means the head gaskets get a bit fragile and they have to be replaced. And the other engine will run terribly. But if you have your head gasket done properly and you get a good quality head gasket set, uh, like the Victor Rhines head gasket set, and you know somebody like you know Mr. Coleman, for example, to do your head gasket for you, not that he's really available, he's a busy boy, but he's done many of those in, over the years and um, he can do them properly. And actually if you have it done properly by somebody who knows what they're doing and you use a good quality set like the Victor Ryan set, you can get more power and economy out of the engine. So yeah, the K-Series, it's sensitive to things like not having the oil done um, regularly, not having the cam belt done. Those are just big no-nos for a lot of engines, particularly the K-Series is very sensitive to cam belts and things like that. Honda D-Series is a less characterful engine. It's a very reliable engine, it's just not very characterful. The um, the cars also tend to, with the manual gearboxes, tend to be very under-geared, under and so when you're driving on a motorway, um, it doesn't matter if you're manual or automatic, it's, you're doing 17, it's very, very noisy. Um, and they produce about the same amount of power. The um, 110 horsepower single overhead cam Honda D series is the same amount of power as the 1.6 K series. So they produce the same amount of power. The K series is, is a little bit more probably economical, um, although it's not by, not by that much. Um, and then um, the, yeah, the D series, the automatics are a bit of thirstier. But they suffer from quite bad um, cam cover gasket leaks. Uh, if you don't watch those, and the case series does as well. They're both belt engines, and you have to make sure that you have the belts done regularly. And that's really all I have to say about that. Um, depends what you want. T series, excellent, excellent engine. Again, make sure you do the cam belts on time. And um, there is um, a, a part, I think a very small part, um, which might, I think it's the water pump, I can't remember, it's something like the water pump. But if you don't change that, then the whole engine can can be very, very fragile. And I think it's a, an internal water pump or something like that. I, somebody who knows the T-Series better than me will be able to say, but um, really, of course, we don't talk about diesels on the channel. You could go for a diesel, we just don't talk about it on the channel, so I can't recommend that, but it really depends what you want. Um, yeah, I mean, my perfect specification would be something like um, 220 or 420 GSI manual something like that uh, with the Vitora or the uh, Saloon um, 
they have a little bit more headroom than the uh, five door hatchback. But uh, yeah, I like the Tomcats and Cabriolets and things like that. If you want to know about Cabriolets and Tomcats, though, look at the Furious Driving channel. So Yosef from Ashraf on Cars says, my question is, what is the best road you've ever driven on? The best road I think I've driven on are probably within the south of France, in the Midi, the uh, region kind of around Nice, Antibes, places like that. There um, is a, a, uh, an autoroute called, I think it's called the Autoroute du Soleil, which goes from the Italian border all the way, all the way across, I think, to Marseille. And um, that's a fantastic road to drive, and you have to pay a lot of money to do it, but the engineering of that road is superb. There's also a lot of twisty roads around there. The only problem is, when I was there, I had to drive a Fiesta, so it wasn't the most exciting thing. But we did the Quasette in Cannes, that was a wonderful road to drive on. Obviously, that's featured in the Persuaders, and uh, you see all of those roads in the south of France in a lot of the old ITC series that they used in the early 70s, so that was, that was pretty good. There's loads of others as well, but that's just for one to spring to mind. Right, uh, Mr. J. Saxby says, My question is, do you have any size of collection of model cars, Hot Wheels, Matchbox, etc.? And also, would you consider making a video about the decline of Infinity here in the UK? Think about Infinity as opposed to, uh, you know, a manufacturer like Mitsubishi or Chevrolet or something like that, is they hardly ever sold any cars in the first place. And they really just were not a thing at all. There's really not a lot to say about why Infinity came to this country and why Infinity left. It's not as much of a level of context as there is about Mitsubishi or something like that. So I don't really know if I have an awful lot to say about Infinity because <laughs> there just really weren't, weren't a thing at all here. Um, in terms of the model cars, I probably do have a number of those. I had a lot when I was younger as well. I had a Scale X Trick set as well. I think it was the Mighty Metro set. I also had a separate car that was an X Fiesta Rexar 2i. Most of these things I think my mother threw away at some point. I, I still have some somewhere, but I don't remember exactly where they are. Um, and yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen them. So probably somewhere, but I don't think you're going to see any on the channel, unfortunately. Next question from Mr. Alan Simpson. Thank you for the opportunity. Why, well, it's my pleasure, sir. My question would be, what is the car that you've been most pleasantly surprised that you've driven? I think if in a professional capacity, I remember very early on in the car salesman career, this was about three years ago, I drove a Mark I Kia C diesel estate. And that sounds like the most boring recipe possible for a car and everything like that but those are superb second-hand cars really really good it's like someone's taken a golf taken it apart and put it back together but only using parts that are not um, liable to get them sued for copyright infringement that's how it feels and Kia's are really reliable most of them have chain cam engines in them they could do really high miles. They tend to be very, very well made. The seed was a huge step up in quality um, over anything Kia had made before. Of course, the Hyundai i30 is a very similar car as well. The Kia had the seven year warranty, the i30 had the five year warranty. Um, I tend to prefer the Kias for some reason. I don't know why. They tend to just be look a little bit better. I don't know particularly why. Um, but that was a big surprise. On the channel, the most surprising car I drove was the Chrysler Delta, which is an older review for many of you who haven't seen it. It's a very, very good car. Surprisingly good car. They're actually very nice to drive. Uh, it was a shame that they didn't sell any of them, and so Chrysler pulled the plug on them. But uh, yes, um, so in terms of the channel, in terms of professional capacity, those are the two most surprising cars I've ever driven. Um, bonus question, what sweets do you consider to be the best car sweets for a long journey? Um, probably worth this original. Don't have many car sweets really. And have a jolly good day, sir, team. Right, we're now on to um, comments and questions from the video itself from yesterday. 
uh, Rusty Nail asks, Jaguar S type or Rover 75? Which do you think is best? I'm going to have to go to Rover 75. I have driven at least three MG ZTs. One, one of them was ZTT actually. And they're basically Rover 75s. And I really, really like them. The S types tend to have actually more problems than a 75 in my experience, or a, a ZT. They tend to be more expensive to fix. And S types have this dreadful problem of sill rot. Now, 75s do rot. They rot generally where the uh, aluminium subframe meets the body. I think that's the way around. Um, I got that correct. Uh, Mr. Coleman, I know that, correct me if I'm wrong, because he's uh, seen that an awful lot. And they do have issues, but they tend to be cheaper cars anyway than the S types in general these days, and they tend to be a bit cheaper to fix. Um, I don't like the styling of the S-Type so much as the 75 either, so I think that's the answer to that question. Jake from Walls Wheels, that's a channel you should definitely have a look at if you haven't already done so. Uh, he says, as I understand you've had many vehicles over your driving career. That's correct. There's a video on my channel called How Many Cars Have I Owned 2020 Edition, and you can see what I've owned there, but... But doesn't include the Sanyong and the Rover um, 45 V6. Uh, what is the one car you regret getting rid of? Probably we shouldn't have sold our MG3 as quickly as we did. We should have held out a bit longer for that. I don't know why I felt under so much pressure to replace it. And um, I think the car that um, we're going to sort of get onto a bit later in the video of another question. Um, we'll, we'll be the second answer to this, but we didn't need to sell the car as quickly as we did and my wife really liked it It was a really good car um, MG3s are good cars and you know, I've I've had a lot of experience with them. I've driven, you know pre facelift early pre facelift late and then post facelift versions of an MG3 and We have one ourselves for over three years and they're fantastic um, we shouldn't. We, we. I don't regret changing the MG3 indirectly for, for this. Um, although you know, sometimes I I, I do feel like uh, you know this car requires a bit more attention than an MG3, which it does. Um, but uh, yes, we probably shouldn't have solved that one so quickly. Oliver Mail asks, "What's the most reliable car you've ever owned?" The most reliable car I've ever owned is the uh, Set Toledo. We had so few problems with that car. The, the only problem really with the car, as opposed to me not doing the maintenance properly on it, which um, was, uh, you know, when, when the key fob battery went flat, I hadn't changed it and I couldn't get into the car. That's not such a problem with the car. That's a problem, you know, with not changing the battery every year, which you should do actually, the key fob. Um, was the rear USB ports in the car fell through the armrest at the back, which was fixed under warranty. And uh, that's it. That's the only problem we had in three years. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be hard to beat, really, that, isn't it? Alan Simpson asks, always another question. You need to get yourself a Sanyong umbrella. I would love a Sanyong umbrella if Sanyong were to send me one. Um, Please get in touch via the link in the description below. Uh, I have uh, found over another question. As a well-travelled man, do you have a, a favourite motorway service station? Yes, like most people, the best motorway service station I think of a country is at Tea Bay, which is in Cumbria. Um, that is absolutely lovely. Um, don't really have much to say about that. Mr. Andy G. Uh, my question to you is why can't I ever think of a really good question to ask? Mr. G, you always have very good questions to ask, sir. You know, don't don't worry about that. Uh, where do you get your love of cars from? When I was younger, I mean very young, we're talking about two or three, my parents were very, very, very worried about my eyesight. My father had very poor eyesight and wore very thick glasses. And my mother's father, my paternal grandfather, he was colourblind. So what my parents tried to do was when we were going around in the car, tried to tell me what the colours of cars 
software and tried to make sure that I could see the colours of the cars properly and um, also read number plates as well. So I learnt how to read number plates really, really early on in life, probably about the age of three. Um, and I also learnt how to identify colours of cars. And so my parents would tell me what the types of car were. It helped that my uh, paternal grandfather was um, in the steel industry in Sheffield. That was his job. He worked at the steelworks um, as, as a supervisor and later as um, an export manager. And he was into engineering and cars and things. And, you know, he had... How many maestros did he have? I think it was five maestros he had. And so there was always lots of cars around, particularly British cars. And, uh, you know, he was very keen to foster that kind of um, hobby within within me. Um, I used to very occasionally help him to fix mechanical stuff. And um, that's where I got it from. My parents, no interest in cars really at all. Um, apart from you know getting me to identify them, and then my mother was a member of the Consumers Association, actually still is actually, which became just Witch, and she used to leave the Witch car buying guides from say 1987, 88 lying around. And I used to lap those up. I used to read all the facts in them and be an absolute bore because I knew everything and more about the cars in them, despite being about five or six. So uh, there we go. Uh, Steve Staff says, uh, not been on for a while, be catching up soon. For now, my question is, which car has been your biggest disappointment uh, after logging to own it? I think probably the Astra Twin Top was a bit of a disappointment. Um, the car wasn't quite as nippy as I thought. It was kind of fun. Excuse me. But we had a number of problems with that car, um, particularly the uh, thermostat housing. That failed. I know all about that, of course. Having had that happen on this car too. And uh, the roof was a bit problematic as they often are on the Astro H twin tops. And um, overall, it was a bit cramped in there. And, you know, it was sort of fun for a while, but it just wasn't really what what it what I expected. And, uh, you know, that's not one of the best car buying decisions I think I've ever made in my life. So Mr. Colin Hicks says um, he's the owner of um, the... Skoda Fabia, um, that you would have seen on the channel quite recently. And uh, also he used to own the E46 BMW, which has now been exchanged for another car. Uh, he says, you now have your new car. Can you take us through the buying process in regards to what the criteria were and which models were considered and rejected? Not because they're necessarily bad cars, but because it didn't suit you at the time. This may have to be a separate video if it's a long answer. Basically, we, your viewers, are being nosy. Well, I mean... Uh, Maybe, but other people are interested in that. I don't mind talking about that. That's going to be a very long answer. I'm not going to cover that here. I've been looking at what sort of car to replace Toledo for over 18 months, and there's a um, video from March 2019 where I actually consider that question. So I'm very happy to do that video um, if you'd like me to. And please do leave a comment below if that's something you'd like to happen as well. But we're going to have to um, not talk about that here because we just haven't really got time. Richard Howler asks, are there any cars you've owned that you now think, what on earth was in my head when I bought it? I bought a brand new Passat in 1998, um, the dullest car ever. Now I can think of all the interesting cars I could, should have spent my money on. Had some then, not now. Wait, maybe you should have bought a Rover or something, sir. Um, I like Rovers. Um, I replaced a Mark II Cavalier with a Belmont. Uh, that was stupid as well. Um, I don't know. I, I quite, quite like the Belmonts for some reason. I, I, I don't know why. It's probably because when I was younger, our childminders' um, parents had a Belmont. And I don't know. I quite liked it for some reason. don't know why. Um, anyway, are there any cars that I've owned? I don't think what on earth was I doing. Probably the 1993 Proton um, 1.3 MPI GLS Saloon. Uh, that was not a great car unsurprisingly. I know Ian Seabrook had one of those and he said it handled well. I'm afraid they don't. They've got very skinny tyres but they don't have any grip. They're kind of a laugh but they are very very tinny and not very good quality. So probably the Proton is going to be the one that I would say is um, yeah I don't know why I bought that really. It did only cost £200 though. 
Next question from Mr. Trabelli, who always sends me the best questions of all, which are always spy um, video, spy film kind of themed things. And um, he's got a new one for me. 1980, new decade, no more sideburns. Yes, indeed, the sideburns have gone. And a new mission. You always seem to be the man for the undercover intelligence world. More so with his next mission. Prince Charles, future king of Britain, is showing a love interest in a certain Lady Diana Spencer. That is correct. She used to have a metro. The media is in frenzy and she's being followed everywhere, but she hasn't yet been given royal protection. Certain groups like the IRA have picked up on this, and intelligence reports are coming in on a plot to kidnap her while she shops in Harrods. The B Star S. Indeed, sir. There are four terrorists coming in from Holyhead, North Wales, on a boat and are on the way to London to a safe house in Chiswick. You and your men are waiting for them there. Anyway, two are taken out, the other two managed to escape in a carjacked 1978 Datsun 120Y. Not the best choice of getaway car, I must say. And are at Hangar Lane already. Question one, you must pursue the terrorists, but you have a lot of equipment. Rocket launchers, sniper rifles, and other ammunition, or ammunition if you're a fan of Grand Theft Auto. So what a state car of a time, 80 to 81, would you choose to them? It has to be fast. No question. Mark II Granada, 2.8, uh, gear X. No question. And we'll go for the automatic because it's a bit easier for me to drive. The manual, I might stuff the gearbox or something. Um, I'm not Mr. Coleman. So um, if he's driving, then we'll, go for the, uh, then we'll go for the manual. But if it's me, when we'll we're going for the automatic. It did George Cowley okay to professionals, so... No problems there. Question two. The second part of the chase will be on moorlands and dirt tracks of North Wales. So what period correct 4x4 would you choose for this part of the chase before you blow them up whilst they try to escape on their awaiting boat? As always, good luck. Well, um, we're going to go for the Monte Verde Safari, which is a modified uh, international harvester scout. Uh, they had engines, I believe, up to a, a V8 in size. Um, they were very expensive, so I'd have to import one from Switzerland, especially, um, which where they were they were modified from the International Har Harvester Scout um, standard cars. 1980, I think, was the last year of production for those. And of course, we're going to slap in a, 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 a one of the big V8. I hope we don't run out of fuel. So yeah, um, International Harvester Scouts are pretty pretty sturdy cars, so that should be fine. So now. We've uh, saved Princess Diana, um, or, you know, Lady Diana Spencer, as she was at the time. We're going on to the final question, which is from David H. My question is, what did you think of the facelifted Rover 45 in 2004? They had moved a lot of the chrome with the new front and rear and a new fascia. I think, I think he means the dashboard was new, which is true. Um, personally, I thought it was a face of too far, and I prefer the quad headlamp cars, like this one. Um, I can understand they're trying to make the car look more modern. I think the rear of the 45 facelift is the most successful bit, um, and there was a little clipper on the key fob that allowed you to open up the boot just by using the key. That, that, was, not a bad, that was not a bad idea. That was pretty good. The issue really is the, the underpinnings of the car were changed and not in a good way. The um, main culprit of this was the security control unit, which I know a lot of people tell me this just wasn't really a problem, but I actually did some filming today um, with a chap whose father used to own a facelifter 45, like the one I had, I had a 2004 1.4 Club SE, and that's had problems with the security control unit. And actually, that caused the car to be scrapped because it was too expensive to replace it. With the uh, Lucas key fobs on a 45, like this one, it's actually quite easy to get hold of one of these. I oh, thank you, Sony unit, for messing up my take. Um, it's quite easy to get hold of one of these, relatively speaking, and there are companies um, out there who will program these to your car, mainly by mail order and things like that, but they'll do that. And Or Summit Garage actually did it for me when I was there um, earlier this year up in Dudley. They can still program these for you. And it's not a problem. The security control unit is not a, a part that generally fails, and it's not in a vulnerable um, place. The engineering changes in 2003, which were, were then cut, carried for, forward um, into the facelifted models for 2004, 
meant they had a different type of security control unit or body control unit, they're sometimes called, and a different type of key fob. This is a Lucas key fob. They were known as the Petron key fob, and they're really quite bad in terms of the buttons going and everything like that. And if you, for some reason, become disconnected from the Petron key fob to the uh, security control unit in the car, then you've absolutely had it. You've completely had it. Unless you've actually got a barcode with, a, with which actually came into packaging of your key fob, which allowed you to program the, the key fob to the car. It's the biggest pain in, in the world um, if you don't have that barcode, because you have to buy some more bar, you have to buy some more um, in the packet and keep the barcodes and don't lose them. And of course, you're going you're gonna to need a new security control unit anyway, because the water will eventually get into it, because that's what happens to a lot of them. And then you'll need to reprogram your key fobs. So that's a big problem. Also, the dashboard actually cracked. Mine cracked after about, I think it was a 2000, I got, I got it in 2009. So by about 2010, the dashboard was actually cracking, which is not good. You also can't have um, the separate cold air on your face in a facelifted car. The headlamps go cloudy as well, which is very bad. And they tend to be more problematic in terms of things like generally wiring and stuff like that. Because when the security control unit fails, it's not just um, the key fobs that go dodgy. You can't use the um, driver's window properly. It, it Mine's stuck down. The intermittent wipe will fail. The car will just go like that. It eventually will become um, something you need to throw away. So if you've got a car that's had a replacement security control unit and two new key fobs, then you're going to be okay for a while. But if you're sort of having to sort your cloudy headlamps out and things like that, and generally the, the quality of, of, of 45s did deteriorate as um, time went on because of project drive and things like that, um, I would recommend you going for you know an earlier one. If you, unless you live in London, in which case you're going to need the later ones because the K series engine was only ultra low emission zone compliant after mid 2003, and if you want a V6 you can't get a V6 with a facelift anyway. So the styling is a subjective thing. Some people, particularly on the ZS 180, like the look of those, but they do have their problems. And um, Mr. Coleman, certainly, who's worked on many 45s, would say that uh, you're better off with an earlier one. So there we are. That was uh, rather a long video. Uh, lots of questions there, but I hope you enjoyed the answers. And... Uh, you know, we will be doing a um, separate video on the uh, buying process behind the Samuel Tivoli. But uh, thank you ever so much indeed for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to uh, the channel if you haven't already done so. Please don't forget to uh, like this video, leave a comment below, and uh, I suppose we'll see you again for some more automotive hijinks and general japery. Um, we've got a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Lord of the Consulting. If you wish me to source a car for you, then it's www.lloydvehicleconsulting.co.uk and there is a contact tab on the front page there for me for you to get in touch directly. Thank you ever so much indeed once again for watching.